Welcome everybody. Um, we're here today to talk about jam sessions. So we're gonna talk a little bit about jam session etiquette and jams in the culture of jam sessions in the jazz community. Um, my name is Raynell Frazier. I work here at Jazz and Lincoln Center and um, my job, I'm, I'm the manager of programming and touring here. And as part of my job, I work really closely with the artists who perform at the late night session. And um, one thing we do here at Jazz Alinga Center is we have a jam session every Thursday and Saturday. Um, our jam sessions are hosted by a host. We have about three or four that we go between. And sometimes the band leaders host them themselves if we can't, if those hosts aren't available. So that's who I am. We have a great um, lineup of panelists here, wonderful musicians, great people. And I'm really excited to talk to each and, one, each and every one of them about their take on jam sessions. So I'm gonna start all the way at the bottom and work my way back down. All the way at the end, we have Mr. Russell Hall. Yes. <laughs> Russell Hall's a fabulous bass player, um, played with Barry Harris, has his own band, and is just doing great things in the community. Um, next to him, we are honored to have Mr. Mark Carey. As many of you guys may know, Mark Carey played with Abby Lincoln and Betty Carter. He runs a session, has been running a session for many years now up in Harlem, and we're, so we're very excited to talk to him about that. Um, then, right there in the center, we have Miss Melanie Charles, the lady of the group. <laughs> yes. Melanie Charles is a fabulous vocalist and flautist. She has her band and she has a mission to make jazz trill again. So please check her out and see what she's doing out on the scene. All right, and then the one and only Mr. Frank Lacey. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Frank Lacey is a fabulous trombonist, played with Art Blakey, played with everybody, and has been in New York for a very long time. So we're just very excited to hear his take on everything about jam sessions. And finally, we have Julian Lee right here. Yeah. <laughs> Julian is a great saxophonist. Um, he actually ran the jam session here at Dizzy's for two years. So we worked very closely together for those two years. All right, guys, let's jump into it. Um, the first thing I wanted to start off, I kind of want everybody to go down the line and talk about why, why are we here? So why are jam sessions important? And what role do they play in this community, in the jazz community? So anyone who wants to start off first, I kind of want to get everyone's take, yeah. I'll start. Um, thank you all for, for coming and participating. Um, jam sessions for me have been the, the epicenter of the understanding of the music. Um, I grew up in, in uh, all the formative years were raised in Washington, D.C. And in D.C. we had some incredible musicians that really took the time to, uh, you know, share uh, information about how the music goes, how it's supposed to go. Um, so I grew up in, in the, you know, uh, environment that the jam was where you met everyone. A lot of people's first, uh, you know, uh, introduction into the city, into the music scene of any city is normally through a jam session. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, hosting a jam se session has been really beautiful to meet a lot of the uh, incredible musicians that make it to town and, and trying to find their way. So I get to meet a lot of the guys and, and, and women that are in the music when they hit the street. <laughs> as soon as they hit, the, hit New York, they come to, come to me uh, or other jam sessions like mine. So I think the jam session is one of the most important aspects of the development of the music mm. and understanding the, you know, the environment of the city that you're, that, or the community that you're uh, embarking on. So that's my take. Yeah. Melanie, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with Mark, obviously, about the idea of it being a, a great uh, tool to see what's going on in the music community. Um, but I also think about uh, cutting sessions and the history of like, you going out to the session, you better be playing right or else <laughs> someone's gonna throw a music stand at you. <laughs> so um, I think jam sessions are a good place to sort of cut your teeth and sort of uh, shed and, and share and, and, and build and really assess you know, where you are in the spectrum of, of, of this music. Well, I, I think that, I think that uh, basically the jam session is the school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Basically, it is the school. I mean, uh, uh, 
um, you know, no no disrespect to a jazz education or anything like that, but you know, I mean, uh, who who in here can name what school John Coltrane graduated from? Or uh, Thelonious Monk, or Art Blakey, or Elvin Jones? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Simple. So so basically, the, the, uh, it's like it's it's basically the school. I mean, from a just from just a plain on the bandstand point of view, it's the school. Yeah, uh, kind of along those lines, um, Mark, you're running a session, you have a session, and so what do you do at your school? You know, like how do you run your session? What's your structure like and what's your mission and your aim? I know we talked about this on the phone a little bit, so I'd love for you to share with everybody yeah. what you're up to and what you're doing. Well, uh, I've been fortunate. Uh, I was given an opportunity uh, about five years ago um, to imagine what I would do with the room. Um, in this particular situation, I was aligning with a, a venue, Gin Fizz, a town, mm-hmm. uh, which for me is, was a very important venue. Uh, it's right there at 125th and Lenox, uh, kind of the epicenter of, of you know, um, the culture in Harlem. Um, but my, my initial idea was to build something it wasn't an original idea. It was, it was an idea given to me by Abby Lincoln. Mm-hmm. And um, Abby's idea was that musicians needed to be uh, cared for. They needed to be, they needed a sacred place, uh, a place where they can, you know, talk with somebody, with, communicate with, with others. So she, sh- her idea was to build something called Moseka House. And that was going to be kind of an ashram, mm-hmm. uh, if, if you will, for musicians, a place where, a sacred place for musicians. So when I got this opportunity uh, with Jen Fizz to, to partner with Jen Fizz and, and imagine what I would do in that room, I took that concept and, and I said I wanted to make a jam session or a place where musicians know that they can come and play on a high level, learn new material. Um, share originals uh, and also I've, I've been a part of a lot of jam sessions and I wanted this one to have a particular spin. I like the B-sides and what happens with a lot of us is we, we learn a, a, a collection of music called Standards. <laughs> <laughs> it's really the American Songbook, you know, um, which is an ongoing process. But for me, uh, I started to notice when I went to jam sessions that most people play very specific songs. There's, just, uh, there's a, it's about ten songs that everybody plays, and that's pretty much it. After you, after you go through those ten, now you're reaching. <laughs> so I said, look, I'm gonna put a menu together. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have a menu for my session, um, and I encourage people, you know, to take a look at this at these songs because they're songs that inspired me first of all to come to the music. And uh, once I was in the music, there's songs that I learned that were very important to me. So I'm sharing a very personal experience, which um, the menu is updatable. So people that come to the session start curr- you know, coming t- more often to the session. Uh, I often ask, what songs do y'all want to play? So we add these songs to the list. But we have a menu. We have a, a structure to it. Um, the way I run my session is I perform uh, a set to, to set up the vibe. Um, and when I play, I play like it's the last time I'm going to play. And that's the energy that I want in my jam sessions. I want people to come and to participate. It's the really the session for me is about building a community ensemble. It's about uh, building a repertoire that we as a community uh, can embrace. So is really a reflection of the community. It's not just the American Songbook. It's songs from now, songs from yesterday, original songs, songs from the American Songbook, songs from Africa, all over. I, I, you know, we're musicians, jazz musicians, and we, we travel the world. So I bring everything to the stage. I bring all my experiences. I'm playing music from Morocco, Ghanaian music. I'm playing music from Senegal, desert music. You know, I'm, I'm playing jazz standards. I'm playing it, the original music of the guys that we know, Thelonious Monk, Coltrane. So 
that's what the idea of the session is. It's about building a community ensemble. Um, it's a lot less about the soloist and more about the ensemble. Mm -hmm. And from there, you get great solos. Yeah, you have you had a really unique experience where you're able to curate your session, you know, so you started from the ground up and this yeah. was your idea and you really put the vision forth. Sometimes you're placed into a situation that's already existing that might already have its own traditions. Mm -hmm. So how do musicians fit into that? You know, like how you talked about standards and things that there's like that list of 10 songs or so that people always have to know, but everybody knows them. Like what's the role for that? I know Julian, you had some experience because we kind of threw you in this situation, which is really unique and interesting because here it's like sometimes your audience is more non-musicians than musicians in the room, mm. you know, and it's a totally different vibe. What was your experience like? Yeah, so um, I love that concept of, of having a, a just a menu, mm -hmm. uh, I like that phrase, of songs to, to expand upon and, and be constantly learning uh, in more of a musician focused session. I, I, I love that concept. Here when I ran the session, um, I guess it was more, not more or less, but the audience would be here and you'd have to get, get the musicians on and off stage quick so you didn't lose the, the interest of the, of the paying customers who may not really have any idea what a jam session is or, or what they even, even is, know they were coming to one. is going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of gets, you know, the, the set would be played and, and then it's like, now it's a jam session. Mm -hmm. And I'd usually take that opportunity to explain we're in New York City. This is the home of some of the best musicians in the world. Anyone can be in the audience at any time. You know, whether you, you have Eric Lewis sitting there ready to get up on the piano um, and just do his thing or a any list of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just keeping the flow of the, of the music going, keeping the space um, just clear for, for musicians to feel comfortable to come up and play, um, settling all the things, what song are we going to play, what key, as quickly as possible, um, treating everyone with respect, hearing everyone out. You, you'll get a, a balance of different levels. You could get professionals who have been on the scene for 20, 30 years, and a kid that just moved from the Midwest going to the new school. And you have to find, find a common ground that everyone can feel comfortable and, uh, and feel respected and, and heard. So there, there are a lot of different things when you're trying to run a session to, to juggle. I was lucky because I grew up in New Jersey, right over the, uh, the river. And my father, Mike Lee, is a saxophonist who ran a jam session, still running one, uh, in, the, in the New Jersey scene. So from the time I was nine years old, uh, I was going to Cecil's Jazz Club, <laughs> run by the great Cecil Brooks. <laughs> yep. And uh, Bruce Williams, who's a wonderful alto saxophonist, my uncle Bruce, he would, he would run a session over there. And I would learn what not to do more often than <laughs> what, what to do yeah. at a jam session. Um, I watched him stop a few songs in, in the middle of the song if he felt like the bandstand was being disrespected or the, the musicians on stage weren't, didn't know the song. Um, and, and then I attended my father's jam sessions all throughout high school. And when I got to New York, I would come to the session here at, at Dizzy's. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just lucky that I've been around the musicians and the community pretty much my whole life. Um, that gave me insights into running the session here. So, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, just to add, you know, you talk about just from people. You never know who's in the audience. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first came to New York, oh, like 1982, and uh, there was a jam session 
in uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Queens, right? So, so I go to jam session. You know, I just came from Berkeley. I went to Berkeley. You know, I heard Wallace Roney playing his trumpet. You know, at, at Berkeley. So you know, I kind of got my thing together on trumpet. You know, as well the trombone. I said, let me go to this jam session and see what's happening, right? So I go to jam session. You know, and, at the, and most of the time it's like mainly mostly saxophone players there. <laughs> so there wasn't no brass players. You know, so I I played my trombone, boom. You know. Played my trumpet, you know, working on my stuff the while as I taught me. And then some guys say, you know, you know, and some cats in the, in the club say, you know, well, hey, man, you know, the trumpet, uh, 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 um, Tom Brown comes through here. I said, okay, Tom Brown, Jamaica funk, that's what it is. Got you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I thought, you know, he's, you know, you know kind of like a smooth jazz trumpet player. Man, I can't, so I guess I, I was coming there for like weeks and then. I guess, you know, he was there this night. So I'm so on, ah, playing all my stuff. Man, this cat came behind me and destroyed me on the trumpet. <laughs> yep. Tom, I mean, no yeah, I mean, playing a, playing a, a, a giant stuff that I didn't even know mm -hmm. that he played jazz like that. He's like, anyone could be an artist. This is New York City, man. Yep. Anyone could be an artist. And another thing, too, mm -hmm. Art Blakey said that, you know, the music comes from the, uh, the music comes from the creator. To the musicians, to the audience, it's split second timing. So, so yeah. people do matter at a jam session. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you know, you, I mean, it is musician oriented, but you know, you're still performing for people, and people come and pay money just to hear you at a jam session. So, you do have to run the jam session accordingly. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that we tend to forget that. But that just just adds. No, that's a great point. Mark, did you have something to say? Um, more on that, I, I think um, one of the important things that I've, I realized about this, the, the jam session uh, that I've been hosting is the list. Having a, a list mm. doesn't work for me. Yeah. You know, uh, and it, it, it gets in the way of the creativity because everybody, I must be next on the list. <laughs> well, wait a minute, what's he doing up there? So I. I Canceled all that. Mm -hmm. My motto is you get in where you fit in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that opens up a lot. It, it, it brings down all of the, the anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. because people feel like, well, I can get up on that. I might not know it, but I can play an ensemble. I can hear it's in G minor. I can play. Yeah. You know, like another thing that uh, Art Blake used to tell me, and uh, 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 Boo used to say, and I never, I never really thought about it. But now, if you think about it, you people may, may be musicians. Um, Art Blake used to say about vocalists. He said, uh, uh, when he was coming up and going to a jam session, he said, Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, and Betty Carter did this. He said, he the only vocalist that he knew that would come up at a jam session, come on the bandstand, hum the melody yep. along with the horn players, mm -hmm. sit down and wait for their turn to solo. Yep. And I mean not sing, scat, just like the horn players. Mm -hmm. You know, you do, you do your melody, you sit down, wait till your time up to come and solo, you come up, bop, 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 just like that, and come back and, and sing along with the horn players. He said he never, the, the only three vocalists that he's ever seen do that at a jam session. So I'm just saying. You know what I'm yeah. Saying? Well, let's let's go a little deeper in that. Like, let's talk about the different roles of all the instruments in the set in the session. You know, the rhythm section. I know the bass has a very special role. Russell, you guys sometimes are up there the whole night if there's no other bass player in the house. Um, let's kind of talk down the line of what those different roles are. Well, um, I first want to say thank you for having us all here to talk about this. This is something that is integral to our music and not just our music. And I say our music because Dizzy Gillespie called this music our music. Um, mm -hmm. Duke, Ellington did, Duke Ellington did too. Um, I think that the role of the bass is integral just as much as every other instrument, but as a bass player, because we function in the rhythm world and the harmonic world, mm -hmm. in addition to the melody world, we are kind of this gatekeeper or this um, medium for all the worlds communicating with one another. Um, the kind of the, the, I think the two 
I'll also preface speaking on my role and the bass's role in a jam session to say that I have had probably two of the greatest um, teachers in a jam session setting that our music has ever seen. The late and incredibly great Mr. Roy Hargrove. Mm -hmm. And give it up. And the not late but very great Mr. Michael Moenzo. Yeah. And those two people have completely altered my reality to be able to understand what all music should function like. Whether you're playing a jam session at Mona's and you're playing, you know, Jelly Roll Morton and um, Louis Armstrong tunes, or you're playing at Arlene's Grocery and you're playing Shaka Khan tunes, um, or you're playing here at Dizzy's and you know it's putting on the Ritz and I found a new baby. Um, one thing I learned is that as a bassist, your your function is, like I said, as a medium. So you have to, and somebody that did a does an incredible job of this, I will speak on, is my teacher, John Clayton. He always checks in on either side of the stage. Mm -hmm. He checks in with the drummer to see where his cymbal is, how he's positioned. Is he feathering the bass drum? Is he not feathering? Is he an active comper? Is he communicating with the pianist? Is he communicating with the soloist? Is he, how is he orchestrating the song? Just because it's a jam session doesn't mean that it's just this free-for-all laboratory where beakers and test tubes are falling off this, you know, <laughs> falling off <laughs> the shelves. <laughs> um, and the same goes with the pianist. Um, you know, you checking in with the piano player. Does he know the actual chords of the song? You know, does he know the melody of this? He or her, sorry. Um, does him or her know the melody of the song? Do they, do they know the chords? Do they know if there if there are, you know ensemble parts that enhance the song and you know how are we shaping the song as a rhythm section how are we shaping the song as a unit um, you know because jazz is about hope jazz is about joy our music is about uplifting the spirit and if we're doing things that are not uplifting the spirit but rather indulging the spirit we are doing a disservice to Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, and their spirits will not be put to rest. Um, a couple weeks ago, actually on the very first day of the year, um, completely unrelated to jazz, um, this you know big, 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 big pop star named Post Malone decided to come to Smalls um, on January 1st, and he was just sitting there, and I said to Joel, I was like, is that Post Malone just like sitting right on the side, you know? And he never heard jazz before. He had never heard live jazz before. Wow. He had never heard the music. But Poor he's guy. <laughs> 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 I know, right? But, you know, it wasn't, and we, we've all been to Smalls, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no hidden secrets. Sometimes it's the, you know, it's the most incredible experience ever. And sometimes, you know, not so much. And a friend of mine and I, we got up and he said, you know, let's 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 try and let's try and you know lead this session. And it changed his life, you know. This guy who's making millions of dollars, he just did the ball drop and all this stuff, and it changed his life. He came up to us and he said, I never heard anything like that before. Yeah. I've never experienced anything like that before. You guys were all playing together. You were singing songs, you know, and like. You know, and I'm also an aspiring vocalist. I'm trying to work on my voice and, and stuff and, 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 and use it in the way that Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie would appeal to people and make people feel, you know, give them a little bit of romance, give them a little bit of humor, give them a little bit of drama, you know? So it, all of it applies to say the role of the bassist is to serve as the grandfather of the music, is to serve as... I, I hate this word, and I'm not, I'm not even going to use it, but to, to serve as someone who can mediate between the rhythm world and the harmony world and the melody world so that everything can function. And I'll just, because I, I, I want to you know, continue the, the rest of the panel. Um, when I first moved to New York, you know, Roy Hargrove was, was so 
inspiring and powerful at a jam session because he'd only take one chorus. Mm -hmm. mm. Or m if he was really feeling it, he would take two. And he'd sing Lady Bird or Never Let Me Go. And everybody would just freak out. And it would just be simple and beautiful and, and humorous and, and joyful. And these are the things that matter in all music, in all art, because we're going through a lot of stuff in our world that is, that is treacherous. You know, and we need we need these things. And and one thing that Roy said to um, myself and the incredible drummer and band leader Evan Sherman, we were playing this blues and we were just walking. We weren't even like, you know, soloing or anything like that. But he Roy came over to me and Evan in 2013. I was about 19 years old. I'm a baby, so he came up to us and he said, "Man, what if it felt like this every night?" And I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Russell. Go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, um, I, I, I just think that uh, 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 we're all talking about, you know, the, 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 the jam session. I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm studying the science, you know, I study physics. So I'm, I'm, I'm like a one plus one equals two like guy, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about solutions. Uh, let's talk about, I mean, things to enhance the, the jam session. I mean, like, for instance, uh, as far as the bass is concerned, I just wish there would be more bass players at jam sessions, yeah. you know, because for one thing, sometimes it's, it's like one bass player, and, and even with that in mind, I mean, people will see, like, there'd be, like, one bass player grandfathering the whole thing, mm -hmm. and, like, tenor saxophone players, like Sue Mingus, would tell me, she says, Frank, some of you young guys so longer than John Coltrane did. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and it's one bass player, and this guy's like so on uh, five courses. I mean, come on. <laughs> I was at a jam session with a, uh, 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 that um, Mimi Jones was doing. Oh, cool. At, at Smalls. Mm -hmm. And uh, these guys were so on so long, she just put down the bass. Hey, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did, did you sit down? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I yeah, it's just, it's just one I and done, man. Yeah, yeah. If, and and that's a great Roy Hargrove. It's like the the thing. All right, now I'm waking up a little bit. But you know, <laughs> the 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 thing I, the thing that's yeah. kind of you know, asinine about the whole situation is that if the great Roy Hargrove, who recorded with thousands of musicians, who played on the most seminal R&B album, you know, in addition to Professor Roots over here, you know. <laughs> is taking one chorus on Ladybird, maybe two if it's kicking. What gives you the audacity to take 12 choruses? I, know, I think man, with, with Art Blakey, I mean, I mean, I play with Boo, so playing with Art Blakey, I'm usually playing, I'm usually playing two, three choruses, maybe four, because at the end of, by the end of the third chorus, you playing with our blanket, you're not gonna get heard anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna get heard. So, so, so I'm just used to playing either two or three yeah. chorus. I'm just used to playing that. Go and ahead. After that, our blanket's coming behind you like a like a <laughs> Mack truck or a Sherman tank. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie, go ahead. You have something to add? I just think that you know when we think we talk about Roy and people who have a sense of like um, consideration mm -hmm. in that way, it's because he always cared about the music mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about, oh, I'm trying to have my voice heard. I'm trying to mm -hmm. say something. I'm trying to kill it right now. It really wasn't about that. It was like really about giving the music what it, what it needs. And I really like you talking about what are some of the solutions, mm -hmm. what came to mind right away. First of all, I think a lot of the challenges in jam sessions make it so that you become stronger musicians. Like the mm -hmm. challenges will, are always there, but working through those things is what makes, you know, separates mm -hmm. Like, for example, if there's only one bass player, you could, correct me if I'm wrong, I imagine that it makes it so that you have crazy stamina. Because yeah. you're like, listen, like, well, I that's, can play I, that's something I'd know? actually that's like cool. to co-sign with you. Oftentimes, I'll just be honest, like, I've oftentimes been the only pl bass player at a session. And mm -hmm. as a, honestly, for other bass players, it's, it's a great lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, How are you going to create a piece of music from 20 minutes of one song, mm -hmm. you know? it Use it to your advantage. And you know, some, the bass players I think of that have done this and have changed the role of the bass is, some, you know, is someone like Reginald Veal. The way that he plays, he is imagining and, in, and inventing new 
grooves and styles and sophisticated harmonies um, under each soloist, you know? Like sometimes he'll walk and then maybe if you want to bring it down, he'll start playing in a funky little two feel or something and then the drums will switch to brushes and then the piano player starts playing up high. You know, I think our, our conception of the music sometimes at a jam session is, I gotta get to my thing. Mm -hmm. I gotta, I gotta channel train, mm -hmm. I gotta channel bird. And, and it's like, yeah. and, and another yeah. thing, I mean, just, just some things to add, like, uh, uh, it's all, like solution wise. Number one, I've noticed that uh, uh, even at jam sessions, uh, the American Sound Book, for instance, mm -hmm. has been, these real books are coming out so much differently now that there's so many re real books coming out that even the changes in the real book are wrong. Well, you know yeah, I mean? and they don't even have the melodies. I don't even have the melodies. <laughs> so, and, uh, 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 and, and I, you know, I, I, mean, I see a, a great artist and musician in, in, in the audience right now, Mr. Mr. Rufus Reed, yeah? mm -hmm. and mm. and I remember, I remember, Mr. Mr. Reed, I remember Prof, when um, I was kind of like doing a TA ship when you was at uh, William Patterson College, mm. and the thing I really liked about what you did there, which I, I saw, and I've been, I've been to so many schools that I get sick when I when I go to a university. I I, I get sick in my stomach. I've been to. <laughs> uh, uh, was that a? Uh, uh, there was a, either one day a week or one day a month or maybe one day a week that you used to do a thing with uh, just the ensemble. And everybody in the class would have to ask questions about the ensemble. You know, certain thing the ensemble was doing, certain thing the bass player being able to vibe with the piano player. And, and that was the only time that I saw that at a, at, at, at a, at a jazz university, a, 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 a instructor teaching the students about certain intangibles mm -hmm. of the rhythm section, certain intangibles of the ensemble. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it, it was really good because it helped me to uh, learn how to run jam sessions better. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and stuff like that. I mean, like, uh, um, just another thing, too. Uh, 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 um, as far as the new, as far as the, these real books is concerned, I think that there's a, I know there's a real book that I've been, uh, been checking out called um, Think of One, Volume One, Volume Two, 432 tunes the real book missed. And, and it's like, it's like there, there, are there are tunes there that are kind of like more newer, you know? It's like more newer tunes. I mean, not, not newer for, per se, but you know, you can play something like, you know, uh, uh, Freddie Hubbard's Backlash mm. or uh, uh, the B-sides, uh, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. The B-sides, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And, and I think that uh, um, with those, uh, with the, I, I won't be too long, with those, um, um, these real books and these American, these standards, a lot of them is based on, the harmonic, I don't know if you're musicians here, but harmonically based on two fives or different keys or five, seven, or five, five, one, which gives the student or gives the player the chance to play a lot of patterns. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, they're not really soloing. They're just playing patterns out of a book, you know? And they're playing it for like three or four courses. So Mimi said, yo, hey man, you gotta sit down. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, how do, yeah, well, how do we break that? Because we've been talking a lot about um, the importance of playing as an ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, the music has to come first. I heard you guys all saying that, but, a lot, but still a lot of people get up on stage and just practice pretty much. Mm -hmm. So what? So what do you all do? Like, what's in your different roles, either as leading I the can't session really sit or down. as <laughs> okay, <laughs> sit down. Well, I, th I'm I think take something. That, oh, please go ahead. If I can, um, I think um, the nature. What we need to get back to to some very basic stuff, which is why do we have jam sessions in the first place? Mm -hmm. Beyond the fact that cats need a, a place to play, the jam session for me was where I got my gigs from. I got hired from with Roy's band the first night I showed up at the jam session. Mm. I walked in and there used to be a culture where there was there were elder musicians in, in that that would link you with a band that needed a uh, needed a piano player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I mean when I got to New York, first thing they I was told was get to the jam session. So I went to the Blue Note and Justin Robinson, uh 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 Eric Lemon, uh 
all the Queens Phil crew, Papa. Phil and Pop, the, the Queens and crew was running the jam session, and um, Tars and team was on deck. Mm. And when I walked in, uh, I ran into Rodney Whittick, Rodney Kendricks, who, in fact, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have none of the gigs I got. I had, but he was like, he he knew my father from the street, and when he found out who I was, he was like, he asked me if if that was my dad. I was like, yeah. He was like, okay, I heard about you. He was like, I need you to, I need somebody to hear you. There was another pianist up on the on the bandstand at the time. And he was like, yeah, I'm gonna get him off. I need you up there. And so he went and tapped the dude on the shoulder. The dude looked that way and he put, <laughs> knocked him off the bench and put me on the bench and was like, go on, play. And so I, I'm playing and he told Roy, he said, Roy, get on up on the stage. Get, put Roy up there. And me and Roy played together and shit. It was like, oh man, this is a, this is a connect. I was in Roy's band right after that. But that has nothing to do with the fact that when I showed up in town the first time, uh, Taurus Mateen and, and um, Stephen Scott, who had been playing with, with uh, Betty, uh, heard me. Mm -hmm. And so my name was floating around yeah. because, listen, the de the, you, your, your reputation as a musician comes out of our mouth. It's I hear you. And then I say, yeah, man, I heard this youngin uh, last night at the session, man. He's killing from, from, from Dallas, man. You got to check him out. I think his name was such and such. I might even not even have your whole name, but I got you from Dallas. I got <laughs> something about you, and somebody else is going to be, oh, I heard that youngin. Did he have short? That cat is back. Mm -hmm. so all of a sudden, your name is starting to resonate. Mm -hmm. And when I grew up, there were musicians like Brother Rufus, Betty Carter, uh, uh, Art Blakey, when I was in, in Betty's band, the threat was that she's going out to the jam session tonight. That was the threat. I'm going out tonight. So that means either you going out too, and you're going <laughs> to cut whoever was is <laughs> at, the, at the piano, or you're going to see who might have your job if you don't keep your shit together. Mm -hmm. So like the jam sessions mm -hmm. were very important. And it, 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 it was the place where you either you know, spread your name in town, or your name became like, don't mess with that cat. He, he keeps going to the bridge every other, <laughs> you know, every other A. So like <laughs> everything about what you do becomes apparent to the scene at the jam session. So if you go to the jam session and you just up there, um, you know, messing up the vibe by doing four or five choruses and not saying nothing, mm -hmm. people probably won't even say nothing to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. They just won't call you. Now, the difference between being in the female band and being in the male's band is the female, like Betty Carter, Abby Lincoln, they're going to they gonna drag you. They're going to say, listen, man, you can't do that. <laughs> you you got to do this. Yeah. That's, that's the function of the piano. The, the male bands, most of them, are just going to be like, uh, yeah, we won't be calling him again. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So there's, there's He's a good cat. He's a real nice cat. He's, He's nice. nice. It's a nice cat. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a difference between being in, in, in these bands. So I say I've been in a lot of a lot of bands. I've been in female bands, uh, 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 leaders, and I've been in male bands, uh, you know, leaded by by males. And I'm gonna say that if you haven't been in a, a, a band led by a female, you missed out on probably 100 <laughs> percent of what's really happening out here. Mm. <laughs> Right. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Melanie, so when we talk, to kind of go off of what Mark was just saying about the jam sessions, the place to get gigs, we talked about when you would travel yeah. internationally, how you use going to sessions in other countries to get work. Can you speak a little bit toward about that yeah, in your absolutely. experience? Yeah, absolutely. That's been like a huge thing for me is like, you know, let's say I have a gig in Paris and I, I decide, you know what, I want to stay. I go to the to the jam sessions, make sure that I sound the best that I can sound, and you know, right then and there, the next week I'm called for yeah. for gigs. Mm -hmm. But also, I look at, at it as an opportunity to sort of research and sort of see. You know, we talked about those same ten tunes that always mm -hmm. happen, but in different cities and different countries, it's different tunes that people yeah. are playing. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting opportunity to like expand your your repertoire and a really beautiful opportunity to communicate. Um, um, with people, which I think is a really huge part of our culture, is communication. Because mm -hmm. jams, you know, we're 
we're making we're making sounds. We think, oh, I'm doing this, but actually, the the bulk of it is the listening part. Because when you're listening, is when you're really dealing. You know. I got I got another yeah, story. Go ahead, another please. story. Um, about about jam sessions. Like you never know who's in the audience. You never know who's around. You might get a gig. Uh, I was uh, out with uh, the McCoy Turner Big Band, it was like 1991, 92. And the last gig, uh, short story, the last gig we had was like uh, at the festival, Wong Le Pin, right? The, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, French Riviera, right? So um, the, the, uh, the club, where they had the jam session and everything after the festival, uh, the pianist Kirk Lysi was running the jam session. They were playing there. But he had got a gig, and he wanted to get away from doing this thing at the festival because he had other gigs. So, but he couldn't get nobody to sell for him on piano. And he said, "Root, you play piano?" I said, "Man, you know, I don't really play piano, but I can, I can play, uh, you know, uh, uh, R and B piano." You know, what I can, you know, <laughs> you know what's going on? You know, I give you six. You know, hey, that's all I can do. I can't <laughs> solo. He said, "Well, man, you know, well." I'll check and see if I, if I can't get nobody else, you may have to do this for me. Okay. So um, it happened. He couldn't get nobody else, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to do the gig. So you know, like I'm saying, that, and I went to the jam session, and by the jam session, I got this gig. So I'm playing, right? What's going on, right? Next thing I know, pow, 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 somebody, <laughs> I, I guess somebody <laughs> came on the drums and started playing better than the drum that I had. I looked around, man, it was Jack G. Jeanette. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Playing Motown, Jack G. I'm just saying, wow. you know, anything can happen. Yep. Anything, anything can happen. happen. You know, <laughs> played in my band, you know what I mean? R&B at a jam session. Yeah. You know? Some, something else that's coming to mind, um, talk about solutions, because I love that you're talking about the solutions. You know, a lot, a lot of times, and also the idea of ego keeps coming back to mind, I think, mm -hmm. with people yeah. But like, if you don't know the tunes, say you don't know the tunes. Yeah, that's, like, yeah, that's huge. Like, that's so annoying. <laughs> but once again, the challenge is if the bass player or pianist doesn't know the tune, and let's say as a singer you're singing, that's a really good opportunity to show to that learn. you do know the tune yeah. right. and lead the band accordingly, yeah, yeah. you know? So once again, it's just like... Yeah, ignorance, ignorance is not a bad word. It's only a lack of knowledge. I remember one time, another story, just in case, I'm sorry. No, no, I remember, good, I was, uh, good, keep going, keep going. 1978, I was, uh, I was in Houston, Texas, and uh, Sonny Stitt was uh, staying, was spending some time in Houston, right? So he had this, uh, this organ group. It was like Sonny Stitt, uh, Leon, uh, uh, Leon Spencer Jr. on organ, uh, me, I couldn't solo there, I just played parts. Me, Sonny Stitt, and Kirk Whalen, right? Okay, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, um, and Sonny Stitt, he asked me, he said, what is a, 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 um, a half note? I said, a half note get one beat? I mean, a half a beat and all this. He said, no, 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 no. I didn't tell you how many beats you get. What is a half note? I mean, what is a, what is an eighth note? What is an eighth note? And he said, uh, if you, he, don't, you know, if you don't know, just say, I no. don't know. Yeah. Just say, I don't know. I said, I don't know. He said, it's a round dot with a flag on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's black inside. You know, that, yeah. you know what? But I learned these things at jam sessions. Yeah. You know, like, it's a school. It's, a, yeah. this, this school. it's not a practice room. It's, it's a school. school. And... One of the things when, when I was thinking about this before we got here that really I wanted to want you guys to touch on is jam sessions and mentorship, which you kind of already are, but I feel like they, they go hand in hand, that whether it's what you were saying, Mark, of getting set up with Roy, that's a form like making something happen, or Frank with your stories, you know, with um, someone teaching you right there in the, mo in the moment. Um, do you guys feel like that's going on today still, or has it kind of, have people shied away from the session nowadays? You know, are people still well, getting mentored at the sessions? Well, the, the, the musician has to, have to be humble enough mm -hmm. to allow himself yeah. to get schooled, you mm -hmm. know? So, but yeah, it, it's, it's happening. It's okay. Happening. I, I, I could say something about it. If a musician, if a master musician takes the time to not criticize you, but point out something that they noticed mm -hmm. that you could do better, mm -hmm. be, gr be, be grateful. Because it means that they like you enough to even be wasting their breath <laughs> speaking to you. If, if, they, if they come to you and they say, you don't really know that melody, do you? And you can be like, 
No, I, I've heard it before. I know you, you, just, you say, no, you're right. I, I don't mm -hmm. actually know it. And they were paying enough attention to you to realize your mistake and come and point it out to you. Be grateful. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't hate you. Another, another, another short story. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I was with, a, I was with a, um, McCarty Turner Big Band again. And I'm going to tell y'all, man, I mean, you could be so on on McCarty Turner's music, <laughs> and it's a, it's a C dominant seven chord. And mm -hmm. C, E, G, and B flat does not work on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, so, so I, was, I was playing, I, I, I kept, I, I'm really not playing right. I went to Joe Ford and said, you know, I, I just, what I'm playing, I'm just, it's just not, just not working right. He said, what should I do? Joe said, try playing something else. <laughs> I think it's also, uh, did I turn this thing on? I think it's also integral for any kind of musician, as we are just receptacles of information, to attend many different kinds of jam sessions. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that has been lost in our music, as the great Dizzy Gillespie and Duke Ellington would call it, in our, you know, in our music. So much of bebop and post bop and trip bop and hip bop and all these other bops. Yeah, that's, what is what, that's, what, that's what I like about his session. Because I, you know, I went there mm -hmm. and said, Plus, they, they play a good movie session. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Take note. <laughs> 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 but that's what nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, his session, it's like, you know, he'll come in, you know, they'll, be, they'll be playing like, you know, Train, you know, some other tunes. And after that, you know, he'll get off the piano, somebody else come. The Mark will come and play something like you know, like a, a late Miles vibe or something totally, or go like or some Afro pop. Yeah, yeah. And then just come up and play them. That's what I like about his set. Yeah, mm -hmm. I actually, kind of speaking in real time, you know, I I attended uh, Mark's session for the first time a couple weeks ago, which is a shame because yeah. I, I feel yeah, I know I feel I I live in Harlem and it's my first time going to Harlem. I don't know, you, you know, but. <laughs> You know, the thing I loved about it is that you felt like, I felt like I was in Mark's home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the, the key here, is you want people to feel relaxed and comfortable. It's a party. It's I I as much as it is a performance, it is a, a way for you to meet somebody and get to know them. You never know what you might, this is a master comper. I, I remember the, the great Phil Shap. He said the only person that got close to the sound of Bud Powell was Mark Carey. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and you know, th these are massive musicians. When I first moved to New York, I, I, you know, I got to cut my teeth in the Smalls Legacy Band with Mr. Frank Lacey. I don't know any personality in the music that has been so paramount to what the spirit of this music is really at its core. You know, Mr. Frank Kumba Lacey. You know, and he's a genius. He has a degree in physics, and he plays trombone, and he plays jazz, and he play with D'Angelo. He play with all these people, and it's just and and Melanie Charles. You know, she knows such a a wealth of different kinds of music. She knows music from her own culture. She knows music from American culture. She plays a the f she plays a mess out of the flute. She sings like an angel. She's the only person. She she you know she si she's singing brilliant corners. Like who is doing that? Yeah. You know, and I don't even need to say anything about Julie because we, I've known we, he's been my best friend. We lived together for for two years in in this hot box apartment up in Har in in Washington Heights. <laughs> so our whole life has been a jam session, you know. And this is to say, you know, jam sessions are a place for you to 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 meet the loves of your life, the people that are gonna change your life for the better. You know, going to going to Mark's session a couple weeks ago. It, it made me feel so good. Me and my brother Kyle, we got up there, we ju he just started, he was like, y'all know work? I'm like, work? I love to play work, man. Nobody knows that tune, that's a monk tune. I got Thelonious Monk tattooed on my arm. I'm like, yeah, and I just boom, boom, you know, boom, boom. And then, you know, and, th and that's the whole point of this stuff is that it's about our music, contrary to the real Congress in, in, in our country, in our <laughs> nation, <laughs> is that? about finding common ground, things that bring us together. And that's what a jam session is about. It's about finding things that bring us together. Now, another thing about the jam session, uh, 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 what people what I, uh, try to tell some musicians, if you're not ready, don't go to it, you know, because, because if you come there and you're not ready, 
you could do more harm for yourself than good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mar I think Mark has I think one of the major that. things that, as far as etiquette at a jam session, is some of the things that I would suggest. How uh, many musicians uh, in the house today? Okay. This is what I would suggest. Uh, this, this community we have, this jazz community, is very small. Um, so, you know, if you don't know someone in, in, in that you're sitting next to, you should probably introduce yourself. So I think a big part of the big culture in the jam session is actually getting a chance to meet the people on the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've been very fortunate because of the venue, um, I think a lot because of the venue, uh, to have, you know, the elders there. You know, like we just lost uh, the great Harold Mayburn, but mm -hmm. I would often do my set right after Harold's set, and Harold would, would hang out. He would mm -hmm. be accessible. Like mm -hmm. live in, in Brownsville. And they live in Brownsville. Yeah. Take the train home. Yeah. yeah. So, and 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 they, they, you know, they might not necessarily want to talk, but if you if you go up and say hello, you might get a conversation out of him. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, is if you're not taking the advantage taking advantage of the, the environment that you find yourself in at a jam session, and really, you know, introducing yourself and meeting the players and the people on the scene, because not only musicians in the jam sessions, you got promoters, producers, yeah. you got teachers, you got people, you know, uh, that, that have institutions that might want to hire, you know, so it, there's a culture there that people know that if I go to a jam session, I'm liable to stumble into what I'm looking for. Yeah. But if you don't make yourself known, you won't be. So Some, I want to Melanie and then Julie and then I'm going to open up for questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, just um, just just to sort of open this up. I think we're talking about jams in the context of like a jam at a club, but like there are different kinds of jams. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you know, even you were saying, oh, it's a jam. It's not it's not like school or class, but actually. You know, a lot of us when we were in school get together in a in yeah, a session. practice yeah, room yeah, yeah, yeah. and have a jam session. I think that type of jam session is just as important, Absolutely. especially mm -hmm. the fact that there isn't an audience there, so you can really get yeah. down to the to the nitty, nitty gritty. Um, of the, uh, there was something else I wanted to say about that, but I forgot. But it'll, it'll come That's back. That's okay. <laughs> if it comes back, you can bring it up. <laughs> yeah, I I think just along the lines of etiquette, especially as a, as a horn player, the the way everyone was. Mm -hmm talking about Roy Hargrove and how, how short his solos would be. Less is more. Y if, if you really know the tune and you know what you're playing, you don't need to take five courses to say it. You can say it in, in, in one, yeah. one quick, concise, well thought out chorus. And the musicians you want to hear you and, okay. and hear how well you play will get it. You and don't need to keep going. The one thing I got to say about the jam session, it's like uh, uh, the jam session and the situation of the jam session, I'm going to say it real short, is like, uh, I don't know, if anybody read uh, anything by uh, Machiavelli, the mm -hmm. prince? It's like, it's like a jam session is like you see all forms of uh, human, uh, yes. uh, human uh, activity and how they <laughs> run things. True. I mean, yeah, yeah, the, jam, yeah, yeah. the leader of the jam session could, could be a... Uh, a benevolent dictator. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He could be a malevolent. He could be a malevolent dictator. He could be more like a king, tyrant, or a tyrant, yeah. or he could be a socialist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or he could be for democracy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it all depends on the jam session. But in every one, there's a way that things get done, and that's. that's I yeah, one last, really Melanie, one last thing, because I want people to ch give a chance yeah, to ask questions, ask too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, 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 okay. I love that. That's dope. It's getting yes. so good. Can we expand this one more hour? Like oh. we got, um, <laughs> just, just thinking about the idea of, like, jam sessions outside of necessarily the traditional um, venue setting, and also I think it, it makes space to remember to be a student of the music, I guess mm. is what I'm saying. I feel like we've had opportunities to jam and I'm looking to you as like sensei, but like when we're jamming, you, even though you are the great Mr. Mark Carey, you become a student as well in oh those yeah. moments. And I think that that's, that's like at the core of the yeah. all of this is that it's a constant learning, no matter how killing, how grand we are, um, you know, that making room that there's always more to, to dig into. 
thank you to this panel, everybody, of Russell Hall, Mark Carey, Melanie Charles, Frank Lacey, and Julian Lee. Wow, what a fabulous conversation. Um, at this time, we're gonna open it up for questions. There's a mic in the center of the room, so feel free to go to the mic and go ahead and present your questions. Well, I, I, I feel like I'm at the Democratic National Convention. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, my name is David Halliday. I live in Salt Lake City. Uh, I've been running the uh, Gracie's Monday Jazz Jam there for five and a half years now. Um, and I'd <laughs> Yes, sir. <Yeah. laughs> Nine straight. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Carey. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, you were talking about sometimes um, mu musicians bring original compositions. So actually I actually have two questions for you and I'll just be quick here. Um, how do you handle that as far as original tunes? Like, do you kind of tell them what you'd like, you need to bring this many copies of the lead sheet or like how does that, how does that work? And then the other question uh, that I have is by menu, um, does that mean that you have like, um, do you furnish a list of tunes for them to choose from? So those are my two questions, okay. thank you. Uh, the, f the, first, the first one, um, the original compositions, I generally ask people to bring arrangements that they know work they, they've already hashed it out, you know, because sometimes you can look at a chart and it'd be something wrong with the chart, you know, so um, it's not like a, you know, a writing session. But if you got just, if you got the, the chart right, if it's something that's accessible to musicians, bam, bring it. I really encourage new music. If you have a new arrangement of something old, that's cool too. But I, I just don't like the, the general treatment of songs. You know, it's just the standard, okay, one, two. No, let's put something on it. Like, I gotta put something on everything. You know, a <laughs> little hot sauce, a little, little <laughs> you know, gravy, or you might want this, you know. So, that, my point is, let's treat, let's, let's give all these songs a treatment, which means it takes a little bit of thought. Mm -hmm. So, I became an MC in the process of hosting the jam sets. I started telling jokes, mm -hmm. you know. That's what's happening, because what's happening behind the joke is they're trying to figure out what song, <laughs> what key. <laughs> so you talk about keeping the flow going. Yeah. You know, m my whole thing is the host has to be, uh, y you have to be open to, to dealing with the audience. It's not just about the music if you, ha if you want your audience to stay. <laughs> um, yeah, so did that kind of cover what you? So the menu, the menu is, we've been relying on digital media um, but we, my wife and my partner here, just my, this is the other half of the Harlem Sessions here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but we work very hard, um, basically, to keep the musicians updated on the menu. The, the menu was written about five years ago. We've been adding to it, you know, as musicians come and, s and they suggest songs, like, oh, that needs to go on the menu. Mm -hmm. So the menu's not stagnant. It's constantly growing, but I, I, I did want, uh, to have something that people can reference prior to coming, so they, they can call. Like, we don't even play the songs on the menu unless somebody calls it. Mm. The songs that I play on my opening set are the songs I wanna play. Mm -hmm. It's probably my originals. You know, but it's setting up the vibe for the night. Mm -hmm. But the menu is for y'all. So y'all access, we'll play any of those songs on the menu. Did everybody hear that? She said that um, another thing that they do is they put the songs on a Spotify playlist, so it's not just a list, but you can listen to it oh, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, so all the songs on the list is, you know, you can go and s s hear several versions of it. Mm -hmm. I learn my songs by ear. I don't, mm -hmm. I mean, I read, of course, I teach music, but I don't learn music by, by paper, yeah. unless I it's, it's on the spot and I just gotta read it, but mm -hmm. this is an oral music. So yeah. if you can't be on the bandstand and learn a song, then that's something that you need to start working on mm. as a musician. Thank you. Jacques Lesure, and I okay. run a couple of sessions in LA. Yes, you do. And could you address uh, something that you kind of, you touched on it. It's, there's a new term that I never heard growing up in the 80s and 90s called, he vibed me. <laughs> <laughs> and because what happened was what you said, somebody told you something, brother, like they told you something and then you went on and 
dealt with it, but now we have some situations in which there seems to be a breakdown in generational respect. If I can mm. give you a quick mm. example, my sessions, the drummer is Marvin Smitty Smith. Yeah. Mm. So guys come in all the time, and they might see me on the break and say, hey man, can I sit in? And I'll say, yeah. Because mm. especially when they come referred by somebody like you all, or whatever, yeah. they told me to stop by. Mm. I'll say, but go holler at Smitty. I guess they don't know what that means, because now when I call them up, there's been times, and you know, Smitty has a no filter. He was like, who, what? Did he speak to me? Yeah. So brother, did you come in your, somebody's house and just start going in the refrigerator mm -hmm. without introducing yourself? This is in front of the audience. Yeah. And some cats can take it and some cats can't take it, but it's always meant with love, but like to teach you there's a certain respect. And just because you don't know somebody doesn't mean that they can't play and it doesn't mean that, mm -hmm. that they're not worthy of you respecting. Sure. So could you address this new thing that's making people not really you know, the wino in the city of wherever it might be might have been the cat one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he needs the same amount of respect you would give the person that your professor told you was happening. You right. see what I'm saying? So could you address that? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, just scenario in general uh, for the clubs. You know, there used to be a time where uh, the doorman at a club would know every musician on the set. Mm -hmm. So nobody's asking you to pay when you come to the door because they know you're supposed to be there. So there's been a breakdown in, in, in the relationship between these venues and, and, and the musicians. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, people are very sensitive nowadays. There's a lot of uh, hypersensitivity going on, you know, for many reasons. There's a lot of stuff on, on you know, on the epidermis I level. I like to add, you know, uh, uh, this music is so powerful that mm. it'll weed those type of cats out, man. Yes. Now, 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 I remember one time a story because I put you so much. I just got to tell you a story. Please. I was with uh, Art Blakey, man, Please. music director. Okay, this trumpet player came in. You know, sometimes a boo would let he would always let cats sit in. You know, because you want to he he go out. And, and Who's the next cat? So, but the thing was, if you're gonna come and sit in with the messengers, you come and ask me. I'm the music director. I'll tell Boo that somebody gonna sit in. And that's the only way that Boo's gonna deal with it. So Boo's playing, so I told Boo who's gonna come and sit in, right? So this cat just comes out of the audience and just stand in front of the band and start playing. You know what Boo did? Got off the drums. Got off the drums and let him play by himself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, those type of cats gonna get weeded out of that. The music is too strong for that. Yes. And number two, uh, and number two, um, um, even in defense of a lot of younger cats, you know, uh, uh, I play with a lot of them. For the most part, all my career, I mostly worked, the, most of the people that hired me is people in his, gener in his generation, Mr. Reed, Mm -hmm. And people in y'all generation that's younger than me, you know, and and um, there are some young cats, man, that's got old spirits older than me and yours, man, you know. But certain cats, the right cats will get weeded out, the wrong cats get weeded out. Don't worry about that, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Um, as a member of the younger generation, <laughs> uh, I will say, because of the self-indulgent nature of social media and other forms of newer technology, um, we have become susceptible to a narcissistic vanity that is a plague upon humanity. Wow, that's so, um, <laughs> um, so I am actually kind of someone that has had to beat this kind of disease and had to find a cure myself. Because when I first moved here, oh a little sorry. backstory, I, you know, oh, oh, I, I, I became kind of the house bass player of, of Dizzy's. You know, I was, I think I, I have the Guinness Book of World Records for playing in this club <laughs> um, <laughs> of five, five months every day straight because I was going to Juilliard. Um, so I was always here. I, I think I've even slept here. Um, but, 
you know, through through you know being 18 and being susceptible to this narcissistic vanity, you know, you you feel like oh, because I don't know how to play, um, you know, I don't know how to walk the bass like Walter Page yet, or you know, I don't know how to play a two feel like George De Vivier, and I'm like I'm messing up. I'm beginning to see the light, and you know, such and such is yelling at me, and I want to shut down. It's actually because there is a macrocosm on, um, of the stage. There's a macrocosm here. We're all functioning as an organism. And if you're the virus, you're, <laughs> you know, then the cure is going to come and turn you into, you know, the antibodies are going to take care of you, you know? And one of the the greatest jam session leaders, he doesn't do it anymore, but he, he fostered quite possibly a new era, a new day of, of our music, the great Michael Muenzo, give it up. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he, he, would, he was the probably the best teacher that all of us had. You know, he'd be like, yeah, I, yeah, I need you to, you know, I need you to check out the way Reginald Veal is playing with Herlin Riley. I need you to go back and listen to Louis Armstrong's music. Why are you reharmonizing the song if we're playing bass and voice? You know, I I can't hear where the chords are. If I, you know, I need to, you know, why are you playing Elvin Jones drums when I'm singing, you know, putting on the Ritz? Th these things are integral to the music. These these kind of this kind of 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 attention and love is essential. That's how you grow. You don't grow by just staying in the ground. You have to uh, bud out of the ground and, and blossom. And you know, different people do it different ways. Roy wouldn't say anything. Roy would just be like. You just wouldn't get caught. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he was a man of few words, but when he did have words, they were whoo, powerful, very powerful. Yeah. And I'm very, you know, and I'm very grateful for the words that he did share. I remember there was one oh, time. Russell. Huh? Sorry to cut you off. I know, I know, I know. Three minutes Sorry. left. But yeah, I want to get to the last Grove. question. Forever. <laughs> Yo, one more. We're going to take one more question. All right, my fault. This is two questions. <laughs> my name is Daniel. Um, I'm living up in Buffalo. Um, two things. One, you spoke about, like, don't show up to a gym if you're not ready. So my first question is, one, how do you know you're ready? And the second one is really, how do you check your ego, right? And But also, like, be humble, but also come off with the confidence to really display what you have. Well, 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 how you, how you, how you, how you check your ego? Go to the jail system and get your head cut. That, that's how you get your ego checked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I mean, no, 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 I'm, I'm no disrespect. I mean, if you go there, you know, and somebody play better than you, that's, that's the school, too. You just get piped. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 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 um, and about yeah, that's what the jam session is about. I mean, this competitive sport. Well, right. no, it's no, no hard feelings. Just, you just got pipe. Yeah, I mean, when I say check your ego, I meant like more so in a way like where you can display your confidence, but not coming off as cocky. You know what I'm saying? Like more so is like kind of just displaying what you. It's got to come out the horn, man. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I mean, tell you. I mean, I, I, no, I'm not. No, at the end of the day, when the sun go down, the moon come up. It's about what's what's coming out the horn, you know, and uh, uh and w uh, trust me, what you play will either get you respected or disrespected, and that's what it's about, you know. It's just a, this. This is a vibe. this is a real music. It's live music. Yeah, this yeah. Is the ocean. It's, it's, it's how good you are today. You might be better tomorrow, but it's when you play. It's what you are feeling and doing right that moment. It's not, has nothing to do with the records you, you played or on or nothing that you've done. So your ego, don't have, your ego will get you to the stage. But you ain't gonna ego notes out. Mm -hmm. You gotta listen, you gotta be 100, you gotta have your ears turned on. That's how you turn your ego off, you turn your ears on. Mm. And then you're good. Because you're gonna respond to what's happening there. The ego is gonna pr precede the note. Ego's gonna be like, yeah, I'm gonna play this, but your ears gonna be like, oh wait a minute, boom, up, yeah. oh wait a minute, he went over there, boom. So ego is gonna say, yeah, I'm just what I'm playing, yeah. and you're gonna be bop, 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 and everybody's gonna be like, that's not what we're playing. Mm -hmm. But your ego said that's cool. If it's your ears are gonna tell you something totally different than your ego. It's just, it's just as cool. It's, a, it's a, like ears, okay? The Sufis, the Sufis, mm. uh, because I studied physics, right? So I went to music 
after physics because basically music is a divine science. That's what the, that's what, that's what the Sufis say. The only way it comes to any of our five senses is to hear it. You can't smell music. Mm. Okay. You can't see music. You see the notes on the paper. Okay. You can't eat music. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so the only way that music comes to the soul is through the sense of hearing. So that's a divine science. You know, it deals with sound waves and frequencies and everything. So what we do is it's everything. It's everything we think. Just as a, as a younger person, show, show up. It doesn't mean you have to play necessarily. What instrument do you play? Okay, so so show up, show up for the the set, the main set that the leader is playing. Sit by the drums, ask the drummer, not annoying questions, but like, what are some uh, drummers I should be checking out? Play at the session, a get feedback from the from the older musicians, the musicians that are better. Your love and dedication of the music and to the music will take care of the questions and, that, and that call you're wondering. the mister yes. until they tell you to call them by yeah. the first name respect this is what i respect and and show up respect. and present yourself don't hide respect but respect the music and the people putting it on that's what i'd say i'd like to say this one thing leave you with this i hire people that come to my jam session so like you said y'all just y'all Two weeks ago was the first time y'all came through. Well, Kyle played last week. Oh, so I hired him last week. So it's, it's a real, it's, look, we, we all need to eat. We need work. Um, and if you come to the jam session, that's what you're going to get. You're going to eat. You're going to work. You know, we, get, we have a meal at the end of the night. So most, most of the cats that come to the jam session get a meal as well. Yeah. They eat with us, you know. I mean, that's my session. I, I can't say what it's gonna be like at another one, but what I'm saying is don't let your ego keep you from going because you're waiting for something to happen here. You gotta get into the energy of what's happening. So the jam session, like I said, is kinda like the central point of understanding what's happening on the scene. And there's many in, in the city, so. Mark, can you tell everybody um, where your session is and when it is? Yes. So they know? I'm, I'm, my session is called The Harlem Sessions and you can find us on Facebook or, or on the net, uh, theharlemsessions.com. Um, but we're every Thursday from 10.30 to 12.30, unless it's going really popping, then we'll go to, to one, maybe two, who knows. But generally, we, we, we go from 10.30 to 12.30 every Thursday night uh, at Smoke, 106 and Broadway. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, I appreciate you all being here. Thank you all for coming and joining me on this panel. Russell Hall. Mark Carey, <laughs> Melanie Charles, Frank Lacey, and Julian Lee. We really appreciate y'all. Thank you.